We, the Center for Global Development, we're a group that try and see how we can make the international system that supports global development work more effectively. How do we finance infrastructure in the poorest parts of the world? How do we increase productivity in agriculture? What kind of policy brings out the best outcomes? What CGD is about is you can ask those difficult questions that people refuse to ask and actually find solutions. We're thinking about how climate change will impact migration patterns, how that will in turn have impacts on people's health. It's challenging to be able to align budget with ambitious programmatic goals, but it can be done. If you can help to make things a little bit better, that's a good way to spend your time. Hello and welcome to the presentation and discussion of the 46th statement of the Latin American Committee on Macroeconomic and Financial Issues, CLAF for its acronym in Spanish. I'm Liliana Rojas Suarez, I'm the chair of the committee, I'm also the director of Latin America Initiative at the Center for Global Development. I am accompanied uh, in this discussion by the committee members and authors of the statement. I will uh, present then after I uh, uh, finish my, my introduction, which is going to be a short presentation of our um, statement. So I'm going to start doing so by sharing my screen. If you allow me for a second, please. And I hope you can uh, see it. If not, let me know. Uh, so. We have called this statement urgent. The IMF needs reform. And the reason why we have written this statement and given this title is because we made an observation on how much the global economy has changed recently. And our perception is that the IMF is not really prepared to deal with those changes. Very quickly, there has been three global developments that are affecting emerging market and developing economies. First is the large importance, increasing importance of liquidity, especially during time of crisis. What we have been observing, and this started in the global financial crisis, if we look at the spreads, the, actually that reflects the, the cost of emerging markets to get uh, financing in the international capital markets, you see that these spreads have been jumping increasingly, uh, very, very uh, largely, both in the global financial crisis at the beginning of COVID and then after the invasion of Russia, um, of Russia and Ukraine. So this need for liquidity in emerging markets have been incredibly high over the recent uh, uh, past. A second development has been that there has been record levels of sovereign debt with not only from uh, the international capital markets, but also domestic debt. These are different regions in the world and all of them have seen a huge increase in this debt. In particular, I would say, let's look at Latin America since this uh, committee represents that region uh, and the, the increase in Latin America has been huge. And the third development, well known by, by most people, is that there has been a, an emergence of new official bilateral creditors, especially China. This is the participation of China claims in the rest of the world. We took this uh, graph from Horn et al., a publication in 2019. So in this context of um, so many changes. Well, we have also observed that there is an erosion in the credibility of IMF programs. And we are going to deal with that in a minute, but let me tell you a little bit more when we get there. So we have advanced three proposals to address this development for the IMF. First is the creation of what we call an emerging market fund, an EMF. The second one is that we believe that external debt and domestic debt should be treated differently when dealing with public debt restructuring. And third, we think that the IMF should be giving new instruments to refinance debt from failed programs. 
this specifically will tackle the issue of, of uh, erosion of credibility in IMF programs that I will, I'll discuss in a second. So let's look at the first one. The first proposal, the creation of an emerging market fund. So what we observed is that there has been a number of episodes of contagion from events in one country, one region, and even an advanced economy that occur uh, from disruptions in international capital markets that are affecting adversely emerging, uh, emerging markets and much more severely than the effects on advanced economies. Why is this? There is a fundamental and a structural reason and a huge difference between advanced economies and emerging markets. In advanced economies, those countries can issue hard currency. So when their hard currency, of course, is very liquid currency that is traded internationally and never, never loses liquidity. In other words, there's always a market for the currency. There's always a seller and a buyer. So what happens if there is a need for liquidity? Well, you have their central bank performing an effective function as a lender of last resort. They can provide the liquidity that the countries need. In contrast, emerging market and developing economies do not have that capacity. Their, the issue, their, the currency that they issue are, is not hard currency, it's not very liquid in international capital markets, and so they need to rely on the reserve assets created by advanced economies, more notably the US dollar. So because this, there is an asymmetry uh, between um, uh, advanced economy and emerging markets, what we are proposing is that the IMF could manage and what we call again an emerging market fund that basically would add in the following way. It would make temporary purchases of sovereign debt from emerging markets in times of high turbulences in the international capital markets. So the role of the EMF is an intervention in either country specific or index or uh, bonds from um, emerging market countries in order to stabilize the um, fluctuation in prices of these bonds, which will in, at the same time prevent that, those huge jumps in express that I just showed you in the previous graph. Now, for the EMF to be effective, it should be, in our view, segregated from the IMF balance sheet. So the IMF, the EMF will have its sound balance sheet and it will have its sound governance. And within that governance, it will have very clear but flexible rules of intervention. We have uh, observed that there are other examples that I don't have to discuss now, but we will bring into the conversation of some mechanism that exist in the European Union that actually uh, uh, plays a function similar to what we are proposing. And also, and very important, it, the EMF needs to intervene only in situations where there is a high probability of a systemic sudden stop of capital inflows. So the idea is not intervening every time to smooth fluctuations in the prices uh, of bonds, of sovereign bonds in the international capital market. The idea is only to uh, stabilize the behavior of those uh, uh, prices of bonds at times of uh, sudden stop of capital inflows. We estimate that this fund should be more or less that the fund would need about $300 billion. And we'll discuss that during the, the discussion that follows this short presentation. Our second proposal needs to do with the treatment uh, between um, domestic and external debt. For those of you that follow the G20 common framework, uh, you know that basically within the common framework, uh, domestic debt and external debt are treated equally in cases of sovereign debt restriction, restructure. Our argument is that that should not be so, that instead, domestic and external debt should be treated separately on a case-by-case -case basis. And we have three arguments. The first one is that the complexities, the legal complexities in mixing domestic and external jur jurisdictions are huge. First argument. Second argument, well, 
when you deal with currency, local currency denominated debt, which is most of the domestic debt, the governments, the central banks, can use inflation to dilute the value of this um, uh, domestic debt. But of course, that cannot happen for foreign currency denominated debt. And third, well, uh, the social, political, and financial system implication of dealing with domestic debt restructuring differs significantly from those effects that would arise from um, uh, restructuring external debt. Think, for example, to illustrate this point, of the social and political implication that you, the country would, would um, um, experience if they are restructuring domestic public debt held by local pension funds, right? Again, we are going to expand on this in the discussion. So no need to uh, worry too much if there's a point that is, I'm not making very clear at this point. But to give you another illustration of the differences in terms of implication on the financial system, let me make another statement. And is that when you restructure, when a country restructure a foreign debt, the idea is that the debt overhand is going to reduce, right? You're restructuring foreign debt, you're going to be actually having less debt to pay. However, restructuring domestic debt does not necessarily reduce a country's debt overhand. Why is this? Well, imagine a situation where most of the domestic debt were held by banks, right? The banks hold the majority of government um, uh, treasuries. In that case, if there is a problem, the government might be compe compelled to recapitalize the banking system to avoid a crisis. And for that, of course, the, the government would then have to engage into more uh, borrowing or another form of financing, which means that the problem of debt will not be solved. So is this actually an issue that we should be concerned at all? The answer is absolutely yes, because if you look at the graph on the right, uh, which actually shows the share of public sector security in total bank assets, you can see that there is a significant number of countries, uh, look at Pakistan, for example, where the banking system hold, holds about 50% of the public sector securities. So this is indeed an issue that a country should be uh, concerned about. And the reason why we are proposing to separate the treatment of domestic debt from um, external debt when dealing with um, debt restructuring. So we also recommend then that uh, the, what you really need also to actually avoid this problem is to en um, enact appropriate regulation to contain this undue exposure of banks to the public sector. Our third recommendation deals with IMF failed programs. Okay, what do we mean by a failed program? What is a key objective of an IMF program? Well, in addition to you know, the loans that the IMF extend and provide financing for the country to solve balance of payment crisis and fiscal issues. Well, a program, an IMF program, provides a seal of approval for what the, for the policymakers are saying they're going to be doing in order to restore the disequilibrium in their economies. And that, why are they doing that? Because they want to reduce their cost of financing and regain market access. Now, in our view, a, fi a failed program does not meet this objective. And we have an example, and the example is Argentina. And we have this graph on the right that I would like you to see for a second. The black lines, this one and this one, are the beginning of the two most recent programs. One that started in June 20, to, um, 2018, and the other on March 25th of 2022. The problem with this program, the first on June 20, uh, 2018, is that the red line shows that the problem was canceled. It actually failed. And then the IMF, uh, after a few years, uh, had another program, the new one, the 2022 um, uh, uh, program. But then the dotted line shows the reviews that the IMF were doing about how the program was doing. 
And only in the first re uh, review, this um, dotted line, black line, uh, the program met with all the requirements and all the uh, conditionalities. When we move to the next three uh, reviews, and the last being on March 30th of this year, uh, 2023, the program, the review of the program had to have waivers, right? Waivers because the program was really not working. To us, that program is certainly not working. And therefore, what we uh, propose is actually to have a new way, a new form to dealing with this program. Why? Because right now, if a program fails, the IMF faces two options. First, as in Argentina, it can refinance a loan with a new program, right? Moving from the failed 2018 program to the 22 program. But that basically leads to needing to provide waiver, waivers for not compliance with program targets. And that erodes IMF credibility significantly, which is a major concern that this committee has. The second alternative that the IMF has is, okay, it can force the debtor country into arrears with the IMF. But that would be absolutely terrible, right? It's a nightmare for a country to have this, you know, a statement from IMF saying, okay, you basically are, are not being able to repay my debt, so you will not be able to repay anybody else's debt. And that is uh, that will imply a worsening in the country's economic conditions. So what we are proposing then is, yes, the IMF has a loan. Yes, it's not working. So what if we refinance the IMF loan we ask the, an, an interest surcharge um, for obtaining this new refinance loan, but we not require an IMF program. Now, if the government is able to prove in a later future that uh, it can actually have a more sustainable program, this then an adequate, a new adequate program can be negotiated late, later, and the incentive would be that the surcharge will be waived. And we think that, again, kind of following the same arguments that we had for the EMF, that, you know, we need to have this kind of new uh, proposals uh, being separated in a way from the main activities of the IMF, we think that perhaps it would be better to handle this uh, refinancing of failed programs by a new IMF unit or department or by a division that is currently not involved in lending operations. So that's basically the uh, all of the uh, ideas that we have uh, presented in a very, very uh, summarized way. Um, if you want to see the details of the statement, please, you can go at our webpage, claf.org slash statements. And of course, we, you can also find it at the Center for Global Development, cgdev.org, Latin America. So I'll, let me stop sharing right now and uh, go back to uh, the main screen and now introduce my uh, fellow authors of this statement. So I am accompanied now by Guillermo Calvo, who is the a Columbia uh, University professor and a former chief economist of the Inter-American Development Bank. Jose de Gregorio, professor of economics at the University of Chile and former governor of the Central Bank and former minister of the economy, mining and energy in Chile. Augusto de la Torre, which currently is affiliated with Columbia University and is a former chief economist for Latin America and the Caribbean at the World Bank and a former governor of the Central Bank of Ecuador. Pablo Guidotti, professor of the Government School of the University Torcuato di Tela and a former minister, vice minister of economy in Argentina. Uh, Andres uh, Velasco, dean of the School of Public Policy of the London School of Economics. Um, and also former Minister of Finance of Chile, and Ernesto Talvi, senior, senior fellow of the Real Instituto Elcano in Madrid, former Executive Director of CERES is in, in Uruguay, and former Minister of Foreign Relations of Uruguay too. So um, let me start 
uh, asking some questions to the panelists that hopefully would clarify some of the remarks that I made during my initial presentation. If you have questions for us, please you can submit them uh, via the YouTube, uh, YouTube and um, uh, we'll address them in due time. Let me then start with Jose de Gregorio. Jose, uh, why don't we start with the global economy? Um, in the statement, we identify three critical developments that call for immediate reform of the IMF. We said that there's large demand for liquidity assets during times of crisis. We talk about the huge increase in debt ratios and the increase, um, uh, sorry, and the emergence of new official bilateral creditors. In your view, are these trends going to continue? Will they exacerbate? And what are the implications of this for the need of IMF reform? Yeah, I think that the, thanks for asking me. And, and I think that the, you point to three, these three developments that are quite important. And as you mentioned, the increased relevance of liquid demand, the record levels of public debt, and the, the, the existence of new official creditors. I think that this is, these are trends that we think that they will remain and they may put some pressure on emerging market economies. Particularly, I want to focus on the increased demand for liquidity and the record levels of public debt in a world that likely could have higher interest rate. At least we will go through a period while inflation is uh, being controlled and all central banks and in the world are fighting against inflation, we have higher interest rate. So the demand for liquidity and the, the, the levels of public debt, the, the problems that, that these developments bring to emerging markets get exacerbated because of high interest rate. We really don't know whether in the long run we will have a world with higher interest rate, but at least, at least we are expecting that there will be a period uh, of a couple of years in which uh, uh, most likely the world will have higher interest rate. So, of course, uh, 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 when there is a lot of demand for liquidity and tensions and, and a contraction in supply and higher interest rate, this puts a burden on emerging markets. And obviously, uh, uh, we have reached after the COVID crisis mm -hmm. and record levels of public debt, which was a sound policy in order to fight the, the the pandemic, but this left with the high levels of public debt, that with high interest rate made the problem of sustainability much more challenging. So I think that these trends will remain and they can uh, uh, put a lot of risk and, and, and add uh, uh, very tough challenges for emerging market economies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jose. Um, with that background that underscores the need for the IMF to adjust to new realities, uh, let's dig deeper into our proposed reforms. And for that, let me start with you, Guillermo. Um, uh, in our statement, we have a central recommendation that is the creation of an emerging market fund. Again, EMF supposed to IMF, EMF, that will basically intervene during times of global financial stress by making temporary purchases of emerging market sovereign debt. Can you please elaborate on the risk of a liquidity crunch for emerging markets and how the EMF can mitigate this risk? I talk very quickly and I think that our audience would like very much to know more about the EMF. Okay, well, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Iliana. Uh, I think that's a fundamental question. And the EMF, which I, in the first place I like because it sounds like IMF. <laughs> so it's easy, easy to remember. Uh, but the point is, uh, it's a very good uh, uh, question. Why is it that you are coming with a new institution we're actually from 2008 with the great financial crisis and then the pandemic and then the bank grants recently, 
we saw uh, global central banks coming to the fore and actually uh, throwing a lot of liquidity, so to say, into the market and helping emerging market. That was very, very clear in 2008. But again, uh, now that's a good question. But the point is, uh, we cannot be sure that something like that will happen. What about if uh, the next crisis starts in emerging markets? That's exactly what happened in 1998 with the rise of crisis. So we, uh, the EMF is designed precisely for situations like that, where then, as it was pointed out by Liliana and, uh, and the Gregorio, uh in the presentations uh we don't uh, uh they, the, the emerging markets don't have the muscle to uh help stabilize the economy by utilizing their own uh, monetary resources uh so that that's the the, the, the basic uh, justification for being concerned and the need for this uh, to happen because uh in addition we are talking about the, the, cons the concern, the central concern is a global crisis, is a global crisis. So it's something that goes outside the frontiers of a single country. So you really need a lot of power in order to uh, do the job that the uh, uh, large result will do. I think maybe I should stop here. Okay, Guillermo, thank you very much. Um, Let's dig a little bit even more within the EMF. Um, and so let me turn to you, Ernesto. Um, operationalizing the EMF has many angles, and we have not been touching on all of them. But we provide the number. We said we estimated that the required funding for the EMF would be around 300 billion. I I um, have two questions for you, and I know that will require more time, but that's okay. Can you please elaborate on this estimation? How do we go to this number? <clears throat> and also, I would like to um, uh, your views on what could be the incentive for advanced economy to commit the funding for the EMF. Well, you know, the incentives are exactly the same as Guillermo was saying that they had in uh, during the global financial crisis that they had during the COVID crisis to, for example, the Fed provide bilateral swap lines to some subset of emerging economies. So basically it was to stabilize a situation that could spiral out of control and that included emerging economies. So incentive is there by revealed preference. And the, whatever the incentive is, that's exactly what the Fed and the bank that issued reserve currency actually did. Uh, so we need to go beyond that. Um, the second, I think, important aspect is that uh, the EMF uh, appears to be something extremely original, but we are not doing anything very different than than engineering in rather than in a doc, in an ad hoc way with no um let's say coherent design uh the emf would put some structure a governance structure um set of rules uh, would allow you to 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 decide and to intervene whenever it's appropriate and by appropriate we mean uh when there is disorderly, to use the European Central Bank terminology, market uh, disruptions that are alien or do not reflect uh, underlying fundamentals. So it is essentially this emerging market fund would play the role of a uh, lender of last resort, of a liquidity provider of last resort, as you said, Liliana, uh, for uh, econ emerging economies that do not have a lender of last resort that issues reserve currency. So how much resources would this fund need? And that was your second question. Well, uh, 300 billion is just a ceiling. 
uh, uh, because let's get that even including the swap lines that the Fed arranged with advanced economies, which were the great majority, nobody's 600 billion. And during the COVID, they were 450 billion. Uh, Mexico and Brazil had a ceiling of 30 billion each during the global financial crisis. They didn't even use it. In fact, a uh, mechanism that actually works, you don't have to use it. So, 300 billion, which is approximately the amount of debt, international debt, of a coming due in the next 12 months would be an upper limit, a ceiling, not necessarily to be used, uh, but probably, most probably, uh, uh, and it won't be to with if this liquidity uh, to begin with. So, uh, I don't know if I have time to address the moral hazard problem, if not, we'll do Okay, let's wait for the second route and I'll ask you that question. Um, Augusto, why don't we move um, to our second proposal? But before saying that, um, remember, if you have any questions, please, you can ask them in the YouTube channel. Um, we will have time for, for addressing them. Uh, but we are, let's move now to the second proposal, which is the exclusion of domestic debt from the G20 um, framework when debt restructurings are needed to regain fiscal and financial uh, sustainability. In our statement, we propose that restructuring of domestic debt should be done on a case-by-case -case basis. I mentioned in my initial remarks the potential problems that could arise from restructuring domestic debt in countries where banking systems hold large proportion of this type of debt. But there is also the issues on the effect on pension funds. And this is an area where you are currently working, so you're the right person to ask this question. Can you expand on this issue? And specifically, what are your views on handling situations where public sector domestic debt is extremely large, pressing on the sustainability of the fiscal accounts, but where a significant proportion of that debt is held by local pension funds? Thank you, Liliana. A pleasure to be here. Well, let me first make uh, two statements. One, clearly, there will be occasions where there's a need to restructure domestic debt. What we say in our, in our statement is that while that may be the case, it does not, it's not justifiable to automatically apply the terms of restructuring of external debt mechanically to domestic debt and that that should be done case by case uh, on a case by case basis secondly i think it is very important to recognize that there is a principle of burden sharing that seems to be behind this idea so if one set of creditors is getting or uh, is experiencing a restructuring of their claims the principle of burden sharing says well other creditors should be doing the same and that's the rationale, but and this creates a, a perception of symmetry. But this symmetry is broken by real facts of life. And we uh, uh, mentioned three in our statement. And let me, uh, let me use two of them to explain the problems if you were to do that in the case of pension funds. Pension funds are the savings of workers and are the claims that workers have on the government. So if the external debt of the government is being restructured, and automatically you force the restructuring of the claims of workers in pension funds, you can trigger two big events. One, in many countries, it can trigger constitutional issues because pension acquired rights are at stake. The constitutional issues are a different sort of problems compared to the external debt issues. And therefore, this asymmetry is broken by legal and constitutional issues, but also the apparent symmetry is broken by pure social and political forces. If, the, if as a result of the external restructure, you have to also haircut the claims of pensioners and of workers, 
then you would have obviously a, a huge social response, a huge social tension, which may compel the government to issue more debt to make the workers whole again, which negates the idea of restructuring, which is to reduce the overhang. So as you said in your comments, uh, it would not work because the dynamics of social protests will undermine the idea of the, behind the, the automatic application to domestic debt. Also, conversely, the symmetry is broken when you think from the other side. Think of currently the workers in Argentina and the pensioners. Their claims on the government are being diluted by inflation. They are really experiencing a, a decline in the purchasing power of their claims. That should not be a reason to automatically restructure, therefore, external debt. So the symmetry goes is broken both ways, and there are very strong economic political economy, financial system, legal reasons to think that the advisable course of action is to treat domestic debt restructuring on a case-by-case -case basis and not automatically linked to external debt restructuring events. Thank you so much, Augusto. Um, okay, now let's move to, in this first round, to our third proposal the failed programs, the IMF failed programs. And for that, let me ask uh, Pablo a question. So, uh, Pablo, for IMF weak failed programs, we propose in our statement to refinance the outstanding loan with an inter, inter, uh, surcharge, interest rate surcharge, but without requiring a new IMF program. Critics of this proposal may argue that the IMF loans without programs is too far away from the institution's business model. What could be the response to our critics, potential critics, if they were to happen? Thank you, Liliana. <clears throat> First of all, when we look at uh, what is the role the IMF plays in the international communities and especially in the context of emerging markets. There are, to summarize it, there are two main tools that the fund has. First is the provision of liquidity in uh, events of balance, balance of payment crisis, which also has been expanded to fiscal uh, crisis. And then the second tool is its role in improving the policy framework. And this is done through conditionality of programs, and through technical assistance, for instance. Right? These two aspects of fund, of traditional fund uh, uh, policy converge when we have uh, problems of access to international capital market in what has been called the catalytic role of the fund, namely liquidity plus good policy contribute to regaining confidence from the capital market, and this brings money in, even though the fund is a senior creditor, has a senior creditor status, okay? So it is essential that uh, to be successful, namely to restore the access of the country to the capital market, the two aspects uh, are designed correctly and are working. Now, what has happened, especially with high access programs, is that uh, there has been an increasing intervention of politics in the way in which uh, uh, the IMF uh, takes uh, decisions. And, uh, and this has introduced situations in which, for instance, the case of Argentina, in which in order to be able to refinance an existing loan, the only possibility that the fund has is to support very bad policies in the country to be able to go through the reviews, even with waivers, and then, and then restructuring the loan uh, for uh, several years. Now, this has several problems because once you have the fund accepting bad policies, accepting policies that even may lead to increased corruption. Uh, this 
really deteriorates the credibility of the institution and the deterioration of the credibility of the institution is bad for, for everybody, for even other countries. Because really the IMF in many countries is critical to what uh, the, uh, the capital market thinks about the, uh, the policy framework. And this is why our proposal in a certain sense is very simple. And is if you have cases in which uh, you cannot agree to good policies, then the fund should be able, should be allowed to refinance, essentially with uh, the idea, uh, with the objective of protecting its uh, credit. And given that this is in a certain sense, a solution that does not include uh, uh, or does not entail conditionality or requirements for the country, it should be done at a higher interest rate to give the incentive for maybe subsequent administrations, new governments to actually go back to the fund and uh, uh, have a reduction in the interest rate on this uh, refinancing and in the case if they can agree on a policy framework uh, with a fund, then gain the credibility, again, that is useful for them to reduce risk vis-a-vis -vis the capital market. So I, I see the, our proposal very much consistent with traditional IMF business. And uh, uh, moreover, I think that is a proposal that actually protects the integrity and the quality of fund programs. Uh, in some cases, if, if, uh, if, if that is, if the quality cannot be achieved, then you have a different uh, window which can be administered, say, by a division in the legal department, say, which actually takes care of, uh, of uh, the refinancing in a very similar way to what the Paris Club does. Let me stop here. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Pablo. Uh, let me continue with this addressing potential critics, critics to our statement, okay? So let me um, uh, ask uh, both um, um, Ernesto and Andres a question along those lines. So Ernesto, let me bring you for a second uh, on the EMF again. And uh, well, you know, we are presenting something that could look very rosy, but the truth is that we have analyzed some potential problems, potential trade-offs that could develop with the proposal of the EMF. Could you please uh, elaborate on that briefly? Thanks. We can hear you. You're muted, Ernesto. Uh, sure, I'm sorry. Yeah. The main trade-off that I've been discussing uh, is the moral hazard. So if you have a lender of last resort out there that it's going to offer you a put option every time um, emerging market bonds are subject to contagion, then uh, uh, investors might take undue uh, risky positions uh, because they feel protected. Now, as any other moral hazard problem, uh, that means two things. First, that um, they offer full insurance. Uh, and second, that you have to uh, design the, the governance structure and the decision making in ways that with in clear rules, they do have discretion to decide, just as the ECB has with the transmission protection instrument, whether a country or a group of countries or the index of emerging markets is being subject to undue and unfair uh, movements that are not warranted by fundamentals. That means that a single country is going to be sure and investors are not going to be sure whether they will be bailed out because if the board decides that the country has a fundamental problem, then it might decide and it would decide not to. So we think that these two devices protect 
the an obvious criticism that it's the moral aspect. Thanks so much, uh, Ernesto. Yeah, I mean, that certainly mm. is uh, an issue that we should discuss even further um, in our uh, post uh, deliberations. But now let me turn to, to Andres with a major issue, again, that critics may raise, right? Uh, beyond the technical issues that we've been discussing, well, people may say, well, reforming the IMF, that's an impossible task right? I mean, that doesn't happen. So what are, in your views, the major constraints for IMF reform? Are government governance issues the major impediment? Thank you, Liliana. Hello, everyone. I think like so many things in life, this comes down to politics. But politics is something that can be done well or it can be done badly. And call me naive, but I'd like to think that we can sort out the politics uh, because there is something for everyone to gain if the IMF works better and if we have better liquidity provision across the world. Liquidity crises are sometimes exogenous shocks or sometimes they are multipliers of other kinds of shocks. But the bottom line is that they make the world economy more unstable. It reduces growth prospects for rich and poor countries. And it brings a source of uncertainty that is bad for investment, bad for consumption, and bad for global welfare. So the first idea is, uh, this is not a zero-sum game. It's a positive-sum game in which everybody can uh, win. Second idea has to be that um, Institutions like the IMF are, in fact, a very good way for pooling liquidity and saving money. One might say, well, in these times of high public debt, are rich countries going to write a check to the IMF, increase the capital of the IMF, lend more to emerging markets or to developing countries? Well, the answer has to be, yes, it's hard. Politically, asking for money is always difficult. But precisely because institutions like the IMF pool resources and because they don't necessarily need to get all the money up front in order to lend, uh, there's a system of quotas, there's a system of uh, liquidity uh, savings, if you want to put it that way, then this is a very efficient and, in theory at least, politically not so costly system for countries to participate in a better allocation of liquidity and a more efficient world economy. And last but not least, uh, yes, I understand issues of governance and quotas and votes within the IMF board. That's a very, very thorny issue. But I don't think we should hang one issue on that particular hook. That is to say, Nobody's expecting issues of governance to be sorted out tomorrow. Uh, one doesn't have to be naive to understand that there are a number of big players, the United States and China most notably, which have a bit of a tug uh, or a pull for influence at many global institutions, the IMF included. But precisely because this is not a zero-sum game, precisely because this is the kind of arrangement where everybody, including the big players, could win, I would like to think that it can be done. It's not automatic. It is not simple. It will not happen overnight. But uh, because there is something for different countries uh, to be gained here, a better political settlement can be achieved, and we should be working uh, toward that as soon as possible. Yes, absolutely. And uh, let me also underline that that's precisely um, um, a big message that we're trying to send through this statement. We see win-win outcomes from these proposals, right? In spite of potential trade-offs, in spite of uh, the difficulties of implementing, we see these proposals are actually improving the overall international financial architecture, to put it that way. So, since we are trying to move on a more positive note, let's see if we can find some more positive uh, uh, development here. Let's see the views of the committee on that. So 
yeah, for Guillermo and Pablo, um, well, we know how the work of the MF has been highly complicated in the last uh, few years because of COVID, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, global inflation. I mean, what the IMF itself called polycrisis, right? In your view, are less cloudy days ahead with a more positive scenario for the global economy? So, Guillermo, your views first. You're muted. That, sorry. Uh, that's a very hard question to answer. Uh, in the first place, because we are talking very freely about liquidity, and we really don't understand liquidity. I mean, obviously, they stand in a deep way uh, liquidity. We know that liquidity had a lot to do with the crisis that we've seen. Uh, but then we reacted to those, uh, like, for example, the Lehman crisis, by, by throwing liquidity into the system and it seemed to work out. And now, after several years, uh, we have inflation uh, surging in advanced economies in the first place. And we are all surprised and we begin to apply rules that were sensible rules uh, before the 2008 crisis. So we are going back to the future, but I don't sense that still the, the profession has a good grasp of how the thing works. And we've seen now recently in the um, banking crisis, uh, how all of a sudden there were problems in the Silicon Valley and they were uh, in Switzerland and so on and everybody went forward in the advanced economies in order to keep this ship uh, from sinking, right? So, uh, of course, you can say uh, what you're saying is bad news. No, I think that's the kind of world that we were at and we should be concerned about that. So. Uh, I think the advantage of going the way they are, we are suggesting, and this is very tentative, we have to understand that given the situation, these are ideas that will have to be developed as we go. So, but it, what is important at this point, you think, I think, is to open up these issues uh, and, and tell the world, look, we are looking at this and we realize that there is an issue of, uh, in the first place, lender of last resort, that uh, the margin markets that we represent, particularly in, in Latin America, are very weak. They've been lucky that in the recent crisis there was some kind of bailout from the north, but one, one can never know. And the implications of this, are, we are always surprised. I mean, I don't. This is not uh, deep uh, science. Every crisis has come something with it that we did not expect before. Uh, even now, the flaring up of inflation, we took us by surprise. And once again, I'm very concerned that we react by going back to conventional wisdom. And I think part of the objective of, of this group uh, in which uh, uh, we, we participate nowadays is to bring in fresh ideas. So the concern we will find, I'm sure, uh, some even serious uh, uh, criticism or impediment to go forward. But I, I think it would be just a success uh, if these ideas that, that we can sort of put together here and we plan to continue working on are in some fashion taken by the international community and we can have a good discussion. We need that certainly before doing any of the proposals that we have uh, put forward. Let me finish here. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Guillermo, and thank you for stressing that, yes, we need uh, to discuss more about this and that our goal is to open a conversation, which is very, very important for us. Um, uh, Pablo, your views is uh, are less cloudy days ahead or <laughs> uh, sitting from Argentina is hard to say, maybe. Yeah, it may be cloudy in, in some places. <laughs> and less cloudy in others. But uh, let, let me be, uh, first of all, <clears throat> it's true that the last uh, year and a half, last couple of years have been quite uh, unprecedented in the 
in the shocks we have seen, COVID, uh, the war, global inflation, banking problems. And, and this has implied that uh, a, a capital a flows to emerging markets have been negative in around 80 billion in 2022. And uh, despite some recovery in January of this year, a uh, year to date, we are again in negative territory, which is totally unprecedented, at least since 2006. So it has been certainly a very tough uh, uh, period. Um, now, if we look into the future, uh, and before that, and uh, I always remember <laughs> when Guillermo Calvo, Leo Lederman, and uh, Carmen Reinhardt were writing one of the first papers on uh, the, uh, the role of capital uh, market volatility on emerging markets, I remember Guillermo saying, well, you know, it's like standing on the beach. Uh, when you have the tide that changes, you notice that where the water is shallow. But when the, where the water is uh, profound, then it's deep, then you don't notice the changes. And I think that uh, this is particularly relevant because the asset class of emerging markets has changed a lot since what uh, we have seen in, uh, in the 1990s. And then you have, and now you have uh, many emerging markets that are investment grade. And when you look at your first uh, graph that you put uh, out, uh, uh, on the screen, Liliana, that is exactly what uh, the tide shows, that uh, this tough period has been particularly tough on high yield emerging markets, while it has not affected significantly investment grade emerging market uh, countries. Now, when I think about the future, I think that we have reasons to be optimistic. I think that uh, my impression is that uh, global inflation, which was largely uh, the result of uh, uh, policies undertaken under the, uh, the COVID with uh, significant uh, money expansions are now over. And I think that uh, we will probably see, uh, well, we have seen already in inflation data converging uh, around 4.5% a year in the US and I think that this will continue to decline during the year so that we are close to an end of the hiking uh, cycle of the of the Fed and I think that uh, the banking problems have shown that now the toolkit of uh, regulators of central banks is larger than what it was during the global financial crisis the response was was very quick and that the banking systems are uh, well, uh, better regulated than they were uh, in the past. So I think that there, is, there are reasons to be optimistic and to expect a period in which emerging markets will start to do uh, better again. Now, if we look at the, the role of the fund, uh, this will all obviously help, but there are issues that remain. For instance, the whole role of uh, bilateral cre creditors such as China is an issue that uh, is still unresolved, needs to be resolved. The G20 common framework for debt uh, restructuring has not worked, is not a good framework. It's very simple, but it's not a good framework. And I think that there is still a lot of, uh, of work to do uh, by, the, by, uh, by the fund to, um, to essentially, you know, have a, 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 an easier um, time with its uh, business. All right, uh, a broad response, but at the same time, quite uh, touching into some of the many points that we've been dealing with. Um, uh, Ernesto, your views on this issue. We don't have too much time left. We're going to exploit the audience, <laughs> the, the, the benefit of time from the audience, and we'll expand uh, a little bit more with our, you know, we can have a little more time, but not too much, a few more minutes. Uh, so Ernesto, your view. You are muted. 
very briefly, and I, I'm going to concentrate on Latin America since we are the Latin America Committee. Um, so first, um, we've been, GDP per capita has been stagnant for the last 10 years. So we are again talking uh, of a last decade. So clearly the challenge of, of growth is out there and we cannot minimize it, okay? Second, and this is, I think it's important. Um, uh, America, uh, Latin America was a very crisis prone region back from 1974 to 1904. Latin America was a main character in explaining crisis in the world and in the emerging, emerging market um, universe. Uh, actually, uh, one every three crises in the world economy uh, actually occurred in Latin America. 50% of emerging market crises occurred in Latin America. Now, since 2004, in a period in which the share of emerging market crises remained a problem, uh, Latin America's participation in crisis diminished to less than half of what it was in the previous period. So, just to so this is not simply that the global uh, uh, institutions actually. Uh, uh, supported emerging economies during periods of turmoil but there is something specific to latin america and that specificity has to do with the fact that after three decades of crisis uh, bank runs bank failures inflation and fiscal mismanagement we learned how to manage the macro with a few exceptions and therefore uh, yeah uh, external factors uh, to hit us whenever they do. We have developed an enormous ability to resist, and that's showing in the data. Thank you, um, uh, Ernesto. And uh, your point also allows me to make the important remark that the reason why the Latin American Committee actually is taking on this large issue that is applicable to all emerging markets is has two reasons, right? First, there is a common denominator between Latin America and many other emerging market economies. And second, because Latin America has experienced all type of crisis, all type of solutions, and is, as Ernesto, as Ernesto said in the past, very prone to crisis. So um, that's the reason why we, as a committee, as a Latin American committee, feel very confident about making a proposal that in involves uh, all emerging markets uh, uh, group. Now, uh, to finalize, I would like to ask a question to both Augusto and Andres that is kind of a problem for emerging markets. And let me see what you think about this. It seems as emerging markets are always worried about the next day, about short-term issues, driven basically by developments in the international capital markets. That's what is in the news all the time, right? I mean, what is happening with liquidity? What is happening with the spread? What is happening with the, the fluctuations in capital market that are going to be affected the emerging markets? Could alleviating the liquidity problem that I just mentioned through an EMF, that our proposal, would significantly help countries to focus on what they should, on their long-term priorities, like development, long-term growth, improvement in poverty, et cetera, et cetera. Augusto, your views first. Okay, let me ask, uh, let me answer this question in three stages. The, the first one is to uh, uh, recognize that uh, the problems, the fundamental problems that require big structural reforms are difficult to pay attention to when you are concentrated in purely macro instability or external instability factors. But as Ernesto said, the region made a significant progress in the macro financial front and has become a better manager of public finances and financial systems. We thought and we expected that that would liberate social energies 
to concentrate on the deeper reforms, education, labor market reform, infrastructure, pensions, health. However, that has not happened as much as we wanted. Certainly, a better financial architecture internationally should provide some additional stability and calm for Latin American policymakers to devote their energies to these fundamental reforms. My fear, however, is that currently what we see is that while macroeconomic and financial factors have become better under better control in most of the region, political, social, security related factors have come to the forefront and perhaps they are taking the energies of societies away from the need to concentrate on these deeper reforms that have to do with growth, employment, pensions, health and infrastructure. So I'm somewhat pessimistic about that. And it goes back to what Andres was saying. It, it ends up in a question of politics. Will we have the politicians that can maneuver through these problems and create a space that we need to devote to the big structural reforms that are still pending? Augusto, well, especially being in Ecuador right now, <laughs> where the situation is so complex politically, I am not surprised that you are pessimistic. But now let me give the last word to Andres and see whether he shares your pessimism or you see some, uh, you know, rainbow <laughs> coming up soon. You're muted. Andres, you're muted. Andres, I think we have technical problems that are unsurmountable at this time. This is, I know, this is really bad. But anyway, um, I'm sure that we'll have other opportunities to hear your views on that. Certainly, we would like to talk more about this. We are beyond our time anyway. So, it's, uh, uh, fortunately, the technology failed at the last minute and not in the middle of it. So, Thank you to all of you for participating in this discussion. Thank you to our audience very much. We will continue working on this. We will keep you posted. And of course, uh, we hope to see you all again in the presentation of our next statement, which will be statement 47. Thank you to all right now. Bye-bye.